Hello everybody, in today's video I shall be talking about classic car prices and why I think the 30 year cycle of car values is broken now and forever. As a bit of eye candy we've got my 1999 Ferrari 550 Maranello fresh back from a very big service at Meridian Modena. However, this is going to be the kind of video you don't really need to watch to get the most from, so if you want to simply listen to me waffling on, be my guest. So then, what exactly is the 30 year cycle? It isn't a hard and fast rule, and there will, of course, always be exceptions. But generally speaking, this is the trend I find most car values seem to take. When a car is new, and it doesn't matter all that much if it's something particularly special, there will be slight variations between the two, but in its kind of honeymoon period, if it is a car with limited supply, you may see values creep up ever so slightly for people to be able to jump the queue and get into a new one. But in the next 12 to 24 months, values will go down and they will keep going down until they reach a certain point. They'll kind of plateau, they'll find their nadir. What that point is will vary, of course, from car to car. With, say, something like a Ferrari, a Lamborghini, that's probably going to be a lot higher than it would be with a Ford Focus. But it's a point where the market says, yeah, that's as low as these can go. Then what starts to happen, particularly with the cheaper stuff, is they become rare. And once a car becomes rare, people start to notice it. Then time moves on. And when the people who wanted one of these cars as a kid grow up, they suddenly go, yeah, you know what? I really want to buy one of those. And because people generally start making their money in their 30s or 40s, that's when the values start to go back up again. And if it is a car that was once commonplace and has now become rare, you'll find an awful lot of people fighting over the same cars. Generally speaking, nostalgia, this is not just for cars, comes in one of two flavors. Either it's something you once had when you were young and you want another one to recapture your youth, or it's something you always lusted after and now you want to buy one because it's the car you had always promised yourself. And it's for this reason you'll often find old cars that were once expensive competing with old cars that were once cheap on an almost level playing field. That's why a Ferrari 550 is worth the same as an Escort RS Cosworth. Perhaps the best example of this process happening right now is the Japanese car market. And this has been made doubly bad by the American 25 year rule. So once cars from Japan get to 25 years old, if they weren't sold in America first time round, then they will be eligible for import. So you've got that double hit of young people who now want to buy their Gran Turismo dream and people in America doing the same thing and they don't have a market there for those cars. So they're just siphoning them off from all the markets around the world. This is why a Skyline is now more expensive than a Ferrari F12. This kind of thing has been going on for quite a while now, and you'll then find that once car prices reach a certain point, they will to some extent follow the economy. We had this in the late 1980s, car prices went absolutely nuts, then the recession came along and values tanked. However, in the last decade and a half, things haven't gone quite according to plan. You see, when we had our last big financial crisis in 2008, everyone predicted classic car prices will do what they'd done in the 90s and tank. Instead, they went up. I can't speak for many other markets around the world, however, two things definitely happened there. First off, when we had the recession in the 90s, interest rates went sky high, so having money in the bank was a very good thing indeed. In 2008, interest rates went through the floor, which meant you could have millions in the bank and you wouldn't really be earning anything. So, even if you're buying a car not to make money on, it's just a much prettier way of looking at your cash, isn't it? So people started buying into them. Also, in the UK, you pay no capital gains tax on privately owned vehicles. So if you buy a car and make 100 grand, that's tax free. A lot of people realize this, and so from 2008, classic car prices seem to start rising without much interest in coming back down to earth again. So that's one of the first ways the market has been somewhat screwed up. You've got a huge number of people who've come into it, not as car fans, but as speculators, people who see these like collecting a piece of art. I mean, you can forgive them entirely, I'm sure, in some ways. However, this means you've got a lot of people who are absolutely determined not to lose their equity. And this means they'd probably rather hang on to certain cars rather than sell them at a loss. That means your cycle is already starting to look a little bit wonky, but it gets much worse. 
in Europe, time has now been called on the internal combustion engine. There were originally plans to make sure that all vehicles on sale from 2035 were going to be at least hybrid. However, things have changed a lot. Here in Britain, by 2030, in less than 10 years' time, it will no longer be legal to sell any car with any form of internal combustion engine in it. It will still be legal to use and drive those cars, and that isn't planned to be banned until 2050, so nearly 30 years away. However, because these things now have an expiry date on them, that means interest is going to be somewhat limited. In truth, I think the real top end of the market, the multi-million pound kind of cars, McLaren F1s, Pagani Zondas, that kind of thing, I don't think they probably would lose much value if you couldn't use them, because as it is, they're hardly driven and they are treated like a piece of art. It's the stuff in the middle, like this, that's really going to suffer. Things that aren't necessarily expensive or rare enough for people to want to put them in a gallery. Things that are common enough to not be special for these people that want to spend a million pounds on a car. And when you can't use it, there are going to be very, very few people willing to pay real money simply to look at it. And I hope eventually this situation may actually change. We may find a way to continue enjoying our cars ad infinitum. Until such a solution presents itself, the market is going to be extremely wary of buying into any investment that has a defined expiry date on it. We are also, at the end of the day, just making too many cars. The value of any product really is always dictated by supply and demand. And to give you an example, this is a Ferrari 550. It wasn't a limited edition car. It wasn't a particularly special car. And they made only about 3,000 of them, if you don't include the Barquettas, over sort of five to six year period. Look at then something like the 458 Speciale, although there aren't published numbers for those, and it's reckoned they made a similar number. And that's of a limited edition car. And it's the same across the board, really. Look at Lamborghini numbers. In the 90s, that was a company that pumped out only a few hundred cars a year in total. Same with Porsche. GT3 numbers are way up. And none of this helps because it means that there are just more in the market, which means you need more buyers interested to help keep prices buoyant. Cars are also too well made now. And I know that might sound like a really odd thing to criticise, but it's true. It probably doesn't affect this end of the market quite so much, your Ferraris, your Lamborghinis and so on, because they were always cars people were willing to spend money on in order to keep them going. However, it's your low-end stuff, your Fords, your Vauxhalls, that kind of thing, where now they're made much better. It used to be that after only a few years, these cars would already start looking at the scrappy in a sort of lustful way. And that meant people didn't really care about them. There were so many of them and they were so cheap and so badly put together, it was far more economical to just buy another one than repair the one you already had. This is how you wind up in a situation where you started off with millions and end up with only a few thousand remaining. That's why those cars are then just as valuable as something like a Ferrari, because after 20 or 30 years, they are just as rare. But with cars lasting, again, that's another part of that supply and demand equation that is just broken now. Cars across the board have all become dramatically cheaper, not just to maintain, but also to buy. Finance rates are really, really low and easy to get. Manufacturers have introduced longer warranties, maintenance packages, and service costs are now lower on any car than they really ever have been before. Even manufacturers like Ferrari are doing a lot to try and make the cars easy to own. And because they are now easier to own, that means they're more desirable. That means they don't depreciate like they once did. 20 years ago, a Ferrari Testarossa would been 30 or 40 grand because everybody knew it could cost you a packet to run. However, you now buy into a five or six year old Ferrari, you won't even have to pay to service it because the first seven years are free. That means I can't really ever see stuff like an F8 plummeting to the sort of 30 or 40 thousand pounds that you would have found with an old 355, 360 or even a Dino. Just not going to happen. And then we have the killer blow. Young people just aren't interested in cars the same way anymore. And if they are, it's almost certainly not something like this. Although we may idolize them, we're probably one of the last generations to do so en masse. I've only had my driving license now for about 15 years, but back when I got that, 
was the kind of normal thing to do. I lived in a town, so you got your driving license when you turned 17. It's just what we did. However, for the last decade, numbers of young people learning to drive have been decreasing year on year. That's partly through the fact that it is a very, very expensive thing to do, and it's also an increasingly less desirable thing to do. Young people are really concerned about the environment, the impact that they will have, and rightly or wrongly, things like this are pretty much public enemy number one. And that means our lovely cars are now heading into a perfect storm. So what am I really getting at here? In short, all bets are off. In the last 10 years, we've seen companies pandering ever more to the ultra-wealthy. Koenigseggs and Paganis used to be a few hundred thousand to buy, now they're a few million. Not too long ago, these ultra-exclusive hypercars were a once-in-a-decade event. This is why things like the Carrera GT will always be special. Now, though, there seems to be a near-constant stream of limited-run, ludicrously expensive stuff that even millionaires would never be able to afford. To prove their worth to these firms, many dealers are now getting their wealthier clients to essentially duke it out to show who's the most loyal customer and therefore worthy of allocation for these special cars. And it's this kind of behaviour which is wrecking the market. They're keeping cars out of the hands of those who'd actually use and appreciate them in the proper way. And then those mortals who do get lucky and can get their hands on one of these cars wind up being afraid to drive them and devalue them because nobody else is driving theirs. On the other hand, there's a lot of cars now being made in huge quantities and to a high standard that we've never seen before, and those cars are traditionally marketed to a younger audience. While today's drivers may be willing to spend £35,000 on a Civic Type R, I just cannot see them in 25 years being looked at the same way we currently see a Civic Jordan or a Clio Williams. Even if we are still allowed to drive these things in 30 years, would you rather have a particulate filter equipped, automatic gearbox only, sanitised, hybrid C63 from 2022, or a fire-breathing, rip-snorting, wild-child, naturally aspirated V8 from 2010, because by then, both interiors will be just as out of date as each other, except one car is going to be actually fun. Anything that's not a full electric car, or at least hybrid, is going to be considered a specialist vehicle by many in not too long. This means anything which isn't a limited edition, ultra desirable product does have the potential to become next to worthless as time goes on. Not because the car itself isn't worthy, but simply as a result of these market forces. If more product is out there than there are people to buy it, prices will always fall, no matter what you're talking about. The real tragedy of speculators being so heavily involved in the market is that they're motivated only by one thing – money. Your average speculator will not hang on to a classic car if it's now costing them more than it's making. I once had somebody describe their F40 as a real POS. This was their F40 they'd just bought, sat next to their Enzo and next to their Dino and their 365 Daytona. They didn't actually like driving any of these cars, they'd only bought them because they were told it was a good investment. People like that will sniff the market changing one day, and when they do, it will be Armageddon. If capital gains tax were introduced on cars tomorrow, we would see a slaughter of prices like nothing else. Great for those picking up the pieces, but for a lot of the industry, that would be a killer blow. If you think this is some sort of far-fetched dystopian nightmare, just re-watch the old episode of Top Gear where they buy Porsches for 1500 quid. That was from a time before we were half as worried about the future or the environment as we now are. And before you comment and tell me that they don't count because they weren't 911s, remember that back then £10,000 would have got you a 964. Try that now. We are currently at a fork in the road. Without dramatic action being taken to permanently preserve the future of the combustion engine, the cars it powered are doomed to become either relics, museum pieces, or priceless artefacts traded by the world's elite in some sort of continual money-making merry-go-round. In both cases, us petrol heads lose. I am hopeful that a solution can be found, and if it is, things will certainly change. But the market will always react to the current situation, and at present, things don't look good. What can we actually do about this? Well, singularly, not that much. But collectively, I think the only thing we can really do is to hope pray if that's your kind of thing try and enjoy and use these cars get them out there drive them while we still can if we're lucky maybe we will inspire the next generation enough to get into these old things that they'll actually be interested in preserving them as well 
My friend Laurie is big into his heritage rail and that's facing a similar crisis. There aren't enough young people interested in keeping these old beasties going. And if you think running a classic Ferrari is expensive, talk to him about running a classic locomotive. That's terrifying. You couldn't service one of those for the price of buying this whole car. Seriously. But all I think we can really do from now on is to get these cars out there, take them to shows, use them, share them with people, try and do our absolute level best to inspire the next generation, be a part of the discussion as to how our future is going to work. Don't ignore it, don't bury your heads in the sand and do what we can because hopefully there will be a solution that will present itself. But until such a time as that works, maybe it'll be Porsche synthetic fuel, who knows? These things are no longer the guaranteed investment that they once were. So if you are buying a car simply to look at and hope it will increase in value, maybe wait 20 or 30 years if you can, because I suspect by then there'll be an awful lot of very, very pretty cars going nowhere, probably quite cheaply. Sorry if that was a bit depressing, but this I think is really the situation we are currently in. Thank you for listening. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.